And thank you to everyone who's joining us today, taking your time out of your lunch or whatever you're doing to, uh, yeah, join Prairie Rivers Network. Thank you for your support um, and, yeah, being here to support the work that we do. So like Jeff said, I'm here to talk about Federal River Investment. More specifically, I'd like to discuss today the Mississippi River Restoration and Resilience Initiative. That's a lot of words jumbled together. Um, I won't tell you what it means exactly right now just to keep you on the edge of your seat, but we'll cover that uh, as we move forward. So first, I just wanted to quickly go over who I am. Um, another one of our staff members did another one of these luncheons. Uh, a couple months ago, and I liked the way he did his intro, so I kind of stole his format. Um, but my official title here at Prairie Rivers Network is Water Resources Associate. So I am part of the Rivers and Wildlife team uh, here at PRN. So if it has to do with the Mississippi River, the Illinois River, wildlife issues, things like that, then it most likely falls under my purview. Some of you may have known me as an intern at Prairie Rivers for a couple of years. Uh, once I graduated, I moved up into a staff position, so I've been doing that for three years now. Um, so I went to the University of Illinois and studied Earth Society and Environmental Sustainability. A couple of my favorite rivers, of course, surprise, surprise, one of them is the Mississippi River. Um, considering the work that I've done in this area and just getting a good taste of how important the river is, it's really supported um, my love for it. And I also have to give a shout out to the Kankakee River. That's where I grew up. So it has a, a special place in, in my heart. Um, I love board games as well. So one of my favorites is Spirit Island. Just so happens to be another staff member's favorite. So you now have two PRN staffers recommending you play that, that board game if you're interested. Um, so what are we going to discuss today? Uh, I'd like to sort of give an overview of a lot of the issues we see facing uh, one of the biggest rivers in the world, and why why it's important to us, um, why we care about these issues, and the possible solution for it as well. And one of those solutions, like I mentioned, is the Mississippi River Restoration and Resilience Initiative. Uh, the, the acronym is MRRRI, which we've just grown to saying MIRI as, as, a, as a shorthand for that. So I'll talk about the legislation, the important components and how it would work and uh, the significance for Illinois as a whole and, and what we can see if the bill comes to pass. Um, so first off, the issues impacting the mighty Mississippi River. So our partners every year at American Rivers, they'll release a most endangered rivers list. And it's a list of 10 rivers that um, you know, are facing very important issues currently. And so in 2022, the entire Mississippi River, so when I say the entire Mississippi, I mean from where it starts at the headwaters in Minnesota, all the way to where it runs and drains into the Gulf of Mexico. So that entire river is listed as the sixth most endangered river in 2022. And so the main threats that are brought up and as to why it's listed are habitat loss and pollution. Obviously, there are so many different issues and they all intertwine in, in specific ways. Um, but the reason the Mississippi is on there is because there are significant threats to its health, to its natural functions uh, in more ways than one. And so to start, I'd like to just give an overview of, of pollution in general. Uh, this, I hope you can see my cursor, but um, this map on the left is just showing you the scale of the Mississippi River Basin. So this dark green area shows all the points in the United States where water will drain into the Mississippi and will make its way out into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so you can just see the, the scale of it. it. It is the third largest basin in the entire world. Um, and this zoom in is is showing you what the upper Mississippi River looks like, um, where we where we pertain as it flows, you know, and makes up our western border. All of these different points and, and watersheds. So really the key takeaway is what we do on the landscape here in Illinois, here in the Midwest, will affect the Mississippi River. Um, and when we talk about pollution, a lot of the times we're referencing nutrients. So 
what agriculture and farmers will do is they'll apply fertilizers to their lands that are rich in nitrates and phosphates. And um, because of the way that we do row crop agriculture, there is no protection on those soils. So when water washes over the land, it will pick up a lot of that soil and a lot of those pollutions and carry it to the Mississippi River. And so what does that mean for the water system itself? It, it means that um, you know, th these fertilizers are great at encouraging the growth of algae. And when that happens in the system, you'll get toxic algal blooms and they will just inundate the water with what you see on the right, this green sludge that affects native fish populations and, and the health of the river itself. And of course, you can't forget, you know, we, ha we see these issues in the Midwest and in Illinois, but these have wide reaching impacts. As I showed you on this map, you can see it flow all the way down into the Gulf of Mexico. And this, this red point here is something that we've talked about before that we have another staff member who went into detail on this, but it's created this Gulf hypoxic zone, which is this huge area that there is just not enough oxygen in the water to sustain fish populations. So of course that damages the ecosystem, but it also damages people's ability to uh, live and thrive off of, uh, you know, economically and, and things like that. Uh, so pollution is absolutely an issue that, that we're focusing on. Another one is habitat loss and flooding. So just to give you some context, this, this graph on the left is showing trends that we've seen in the upper Mississippi River. So when I say upper Mississippi, I'm talking about the headwaters in Minnesota flowing all the way down through Illinois. Um, and so you can see the hydrology of the, of the river. So what we mean by that is the water that's entering the system and leaving the system. These red arrows pointing up indicate a significant long-term increase in how much water is coming into the system, leaving the system, the duration of how long those high flows last. Um, and I think the perfect example that we've seen, it was in 2019. It, the, the Mississippi set records for how long it was at flood stage. And so, you know, we see these issues just becoming worse. And that goes hand in hand with these blue arrows that are pointing downward, um, showing that forest cover uh, has, has decreased significantly over the long term in a lot of these different areas. And that is because of the way the Mississippi is managed. Um, and I'll get it, I'll get into that in a second. But um, you know, we, we manage it for commerce or for navigation or to protect from flooding. And so as, as a result, it's so disconnected from its floodplain and from important wetlands. And that significantly affects its natural functions in the long term as well. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that all of these issues are just exacerbated by climate change. Um, we're going to see longer storms, longer rain events, uh, less thawing and freezing cycle in the winter. So more water is simply going to enter the Mississippi River system and start to inundate it um, in ways that we haven't seen before. And uh, again, 2019 is a good example of that. And of course, the way we manage the Mississippi, a lot of that has to do with building up of levees. And I'd just like to quickly explain what a levee is to give some folks context, but this picture represents it well. So you have a river flowing on one side of it and uh, this earthen mound that's been built up on a slope so that if this river does come up on the shoreline or, or it's, uh, there's a lot of water in the system, this levee, will act as an embankment to prevent that river from overflowing and protecting whatever is on the other side of this, whether that be cropland, agriculture, whether it be a, a town, whatever have you. And so we've seen a lot of this built up on the Mississippi for, for years, um, just to make sure that uh, it's upholding the system of agriculture and, and preventing people from losing their crops and their livelihoods. Um, but one of those issues with this is how it interacts between communities and, and other, other folks on the, on the river. 
So in 2019, I was actually able to travel um, over to Hannibal, Missouri. Uh, it was in June of 2019, actually. And so what I did, I traveled out there to talk to folks, and I was actually able to take a tour of some of uh, the town itself and uh, the levees that are surrounding the community. And so first, I started out on the eastern part of the Mississippi on the Illinois side, because there is a levee drainage district there. And when I say levee drainage district, I mean, uh, it's an entity that's meant to manage a system of levees that protect agriculture land from being flooded. And so this drainage district in particular had built up their levees. You can see it on the right here. This is a good map of, of where these levees are. So you have the Mississippi flowing down here, um, acting as the border between Illinois and Missouri. And here, this red line is a representation of where these levees are built how it sort of zigzags, but stays along the bank of the river so that when it is in flood stage, it keeps water from entering this shaded area. But the issue is they build this up. So the, these pictures are, are pictures that I took when I went out there. Um, they'll build these up. On the left here, you can see this fresh dirt piled on top of the levee that they had just put up. Again, this was in June of 2019, so the water was incredibly high. And so the drainage district will get a permit in case of emergency to build up their levees, to increase it by two feet in some cases, um, so that uh, in case there is an emergency or that there is flooding, it'll keep that water out. And so that's what they did this year. But in a lot of cases, and what we've seen in Illinois and in the Midwest is that people don't always follow these permits. What's supposed to happen is that once the flood event is over and things are starting to settle down, the drainage district is supposed to return the dimensions of their levy back to what is legally allowed. Um, but as it is often the case, they won't do that. And um, the fact of the matter is this water has to go somewhere. Um, be, just based on the hydrology of the river. If you're keeping water out in one place, that water will be pushed onto another. And so on this trip, I traveled back from this east side of the river into Hannibal itself. And if some of you are familiar with Hannibal, it has a very rich history with the Mississippi, the birth, birthplace of Mark Twain. They celebrate him and uh, you know his prolific authoring of books that, that have to do with the Mississippi. Um, and so I was able to visit and sort of talk to the folks there. And this is a, a couple pictures that I took in their downtown area. And you can see they have water coming up to their doorstep. They had to build up their flood wall that they have um, for, for events like this to prevent water from entering their downtown area and inundating people and businesses. Um, so you can see the, the contrast and uh, there's communities like this who are dealing with more water because of other actors like those drainage districts who are building up their levees. Um, you know, the, in some cases they can see an extra foot and a half of water coming onto their their uh, their towns. And uh, this this really isn't even the most extreme case. Some other communities weren't as lucky. There's a, there's a lot of pictures out there that. Um, you know, show towns being completely inundated and, and unable to prevent uh, stuff like this from happening. And another issue that I wanted, wanted to focus on is navigation as well. Uh, so when I talk about navigation, I mean uh, the transportation of goods up and down the river on, on this picture on the right here, something like this on a, on a barge. Um, and so what the Army Corps of Engineers has done is they've built up this system of locks and dams. And it will help create these pools of water that allow for quicker navigation up and down the river to transport things like grains, uh, chemicals. Um, used to be that there was a lot of coal moving up and down the river here in Illinois. Um, thankfully, that the input of that has decreased, but the point remains that uh, these locks and dams still exist. 
they also dredge or dig up the the base and the 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 channel itself to maintain a certain depth because these barges they need uh yeah certain depth in order to basically move up and down the river without being stuck but this system and navigating on a river such as the mississippi is um it's at the whim of how the river is behaving. So in 2019, for example, or in other years, when the river is just too high, these these barges are basically stuck on the river itself. So it's, it's very dependent on how the river is behaving. Um, and like I said before, climate change is just going to worsen those, those symptoms and uh, make a lot of these these factors just worse. Um, so a lot of a lot of folks picture the Mississippi as, like I said, a pipeline for commerce, and utilizing it uh, in a way that is quite unnatural for for the natural functions of the river. And these these graphs sort of show the changes that you can see. Um, for example, here in these two upper graphs, one is a representation of this darker area, the flow of the Mississippi in the 1890s. And then you can see how it's changed um, in 2010, for example. And this is because of those locks and dams. They've created these almost pools and, and lakes of water that have significantly altered the hydrology of the system and, and how it behaves. Um, so why should we really care? I know it's it's kind of a, a difficult subject, at least, you know, I live in Champaign. Um, there, there isn't a huge connection to the Mississippi River physically, but like I pointed out before, it really doesn't matter because what we do here on the landscape is still going to impact this massive system. Um, so there are so many different reasons why we should care about what happens to the Mississippi. Uh, one of them is the cultural significance, and that that might be for the indigenous people who used to live and and thrive on the Mississippi until European settlers came and uh, changed our relationship with it. Um, and it's culturally significant for America's pastime as well. Of course, you know, I've talked about the safety for many communities up and down the river, whether that be with flooding, pollution, things like that. Um, the Mississippi also provides drinking water for more than 20 million people in 50 cities. Like I, like I just want to reiterate, it's such a massive and significant system um, that we want to be sure that you know we're caring for the water and the inputs that are going into it. And of course, it supports a huge array of fish and wildlife, um, more than 780 species, it acts as a migration corridor for 60% of all North American birds, um, which is just, it's, that's hard to imagine in a lot of cases, but uh, it just goes to show how important the system is, um, not only for habitat, but for the people who live along it. And so now it's time to sort of get to the positives, you know, what we can do to facilitate in a new age of how we're going to restore and protect the Mississippi River. Uh, and so what I mentioned before, so there's a there's currently a bill in the United States Congress. It's called the Mississippi River Restoration and Resilience Initiative Act, or H.R. 4202. This bill was introduced and is championed by Representative Betty McCollum. She's in Minnesota. Um, but I'd also like to mention that there's a lot of our partner organizations that have that have championed this bill as well, including uh, the Mississippi River Network. Friends of the Mississippi River, American Rivers, like I've mentioned before, the National Wildlife Federation, and so many more who have worked very hard to, to get this bill to become what it is. Um, so more details about sort of the nitty gritty policy stuff. Um, first and foremost, it is voluntary and non-regulatory. So what I mean by that is this bill does not serve to create new laws or um, new parameters for anyone to operate on. It's supposed to be a geographic program within the Environmental Protection Agency that is focused on restoring the Mississippi River and um, making the communities along it more resilient. So yes, it doesn't create any new laws. It, it's uh, funding to do that. So 
right now, as the bill stands, we're looking at 300 to 350 million per year in federal funding. And that, that could be distributed to all main stem river states. So Illinois, including of course, and, and tribal nations. Um, so it would add on to a lot of the restoration funding that we see coming into the Mississippi River in the first place. And uh, the EPA would facilitate coordination with other agencies and distribute funds to governments, whether that's state, regional, local communities, tribes and tribal governments, nonprofit organizations, if they're doing work on the ground that, that helps um, restore the Mississippi and its natural functions. And it would facilitate other partnerships as well. So this is modeled off of many other successful proven programs. One of them that we're very familiar with here in the Midwest is the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative on this map. This, this is GLRI. Um, so every single dot here is a, is a project that, that, that's working to make sure the Great Lakes are staying healthy. So this is also a geographic program within the EPA that um, sends funding to a lot of communities, organizations, governments to do projects along the Great Lakes. And we're hoping to model that and see it happen along the entire Mississippi River. So what are some of the key focus areas of MIRI? You know, I've talked about sort of the high level stuff and what we can expect to see happen if the bill does get passed. Um, but there are sort of four focus areas to talk about when it comes to what kind of projects we can see actually come to fruition on the ground. Um, so one of them is restoring clean water. I talked about pollution, um, you know, protect and restore river habitat, rebuilding nat natural infrastructure. And I'll, I'll get into more details about that. Um, and then also reducing the impact of aquatic invasive species in the system. So when we talk about clean water, we're, ta we're mostly talking about um, two big buckets. So that could be urban runoff. Um, MIRI would focus on funding projects that would prevent stormwater pollution um, and prevent raw sewage from discharging into surface waters that eventually make its way into the Mississippi River system. We're also talking about agricultural runoff, like I mentioned before, preventing a lot of these nitrates and phosphates and this nutrient pollution from moving off the land and into um, the river system. So that could mean funding programs that encourage the planting of cover crops, for example, making sure that agricultural land has continuous vegetative cover. Basically that would help prevent soil from eroding. It would help keep these nutrients in the soil and out of our water systems. Um, and so MIRI would cover that. It would, it would help promote these systems, um, both here in Illinois and in the Midwest in general. We're also looking at things like habitat restoration. Um, I, I showed you sort of the loss of habitat that we've seen because of the way that the Mississippi is, is managed, but MIRI would act to uh, promote projects that would restore wetlands and floodplains. It would help reconnect the river with some side channels and backwaters that would help facilitate the success of native species across the board. So projects like that, that would not only help promote species success and you know some of these species that we love and hold dear to us, but it would also support uh, a lot of the um, you know recreation that we see here in Illinois and for communities to support uh, their economic background and uh, bolster what they can do and their relationship with the river. Um, you know, we also see natural infrastructure uh, projects coming into play with MIRI as well. Um, we've talked about natural infrastructure before, but, you know, basically that can, that can mean moving levees away from the river, for example, um, allowing portions of it to flood naturally, uh, to to take the burden and take the pressure off of other communities and people up and down the river. Um, so, you know, we it would promote voluntary easements and like I said, removing levees or modifying them in a way that promotes uh, the natural functions of the Mississippi. Um, 
and you know we we'd see projects that are meant to deter and research harmful invasive species uh, we've covered before the problem of invasive carp and the risk of it moving into the great lakes but you know the mississippi is the crux of that um, right now it is it is a true struggle to deal with these invasive species and so miri would act as a catalyst to fund projects that uh, reduce those impacts and that would go hand in hand with funding to reintroduce native species of fish of of mussels of of other aquatic species um, to support the overall the overall health of the river so another important aspect of miri as it stands right now and where the bill is at is um, this concept of equity. A lot of these issues that I've talked about, whether it be flooding, pollution, they disproportionately affect communities of color or low-income communities because of historic inequities, uh, you know, environmental racism that have put a lot of these people on the front lines of these issues. Um, so there are specific provisions within MIRI that seek to address a lot of those things. Um, 25% of the funding is supposed to go to communities of color or low income communities. And then an extra 10% are supposed to go to communities that experience persistent poverty. So I think it's just extremely important to, to make sure that these provisions make it to the finish line. Um, because, you know, there, this is this is a good avenue to try to, you know, address those historic inequities. So there is a good significance of Illinois, too, for, for Miri passing. Uh, these are just a couple of examples that, that I'd like to touch on. Um, but I mentioned cover crops. Illinois has a pretty robust fall covers for spring savings initiative that will basically pay farmers to plant cover crops so that over the winter, there is continuous cover along the landscape that um, you know, helps retain water, reduce soil loss, prevent nutrient runoff. And so MIRI would potentially act as an additive to those restoration initiatives um, to help farmers keep pollutions out of our waterways and eventually into the Mississippi River. Another specific example that's currently going on that MIRI could support is for the Galena River up in uh, northwestern Illinois. Um, They've, they've been doing projects to help reduce flood risk and improve water quality. And so it's things like this that, um, you know, we can see pop up in Illinois that can really help uh, support so many different restoration initiatives, whether they're ongoing now or whether they're going to be created uh, in the future. So that sort of leaves us at to where we are now in the process. So like I mentioned, um, this bill was introduced last year by Representative Betty McCollum. Um, so the, the, the hopeful timeline is that it will move through Congress uh, and then eventually be signed into law. And once that happens, it kicks off um, a, a, about a two-year effort by the EPA to lead a public process and create a MIRI action plan. So that means that the EPA would hold sessions and take comments from communities in along the Mississippi River and in those states that are affected by it to get input. Uh, that, that's what this is all about, to make sure that communities are at the table, they have their voices heard, and they can sort of shape many of the projects that we're hoping to see um, come into play when, uh, when Miri is passed. Uh, and, and with that is also a, a science plan that goes hand in hand. We want to make sure that there's these evidence-based processes and there's enough research going on that, that support a lot of smart decisions happening with MIRI. Um, and these plans, you know, they're not a one-time thing. They'll be updated periodically so that if things change, you know, whatever sort of circumstances are going on, then, uh, you know, there's there's input and there's people at the table making those decisions. Um, so there are some things that, that folks on the call can do now, some of our members can do. You might've already filled out one of our action alerts, um, but we have one live right now and 
and basically you can go on our website and uh, fill out a form and you'll send a message to your senators and your congressperson that asks them to support Miri. Um, and, and when it comes up to, to vote for the bill and uh, basically putting it on their radar to, to make sure that they know what's going on. Um, you can also listen to our latest episode of Stories from the Floodplain. That's our podcast that we put out. Our latest episode was timely. We, we talked to one of our partners at American Rivers, um, Olivia Dorothy, who is entrenched in these issues and has a, has a good sense of, of what's going on with Miri and the overall uh, issues facing the river. And so that, you know, it'd be great to, to have some of you all listen and get more of an in-depth view of, of what's going on. But otherwise, that is it for me for, for this presentation, at least. I, I know we're going to open it up for questions, but thank you again for joining us today, and we appreciate it.